Lucy? <laughs> no, wait a second. Your hair's the same color as mine. How'd this happen? And mine. That was the point. I decided I want to look like all you guys. Oh, that's great. <laughs> this is the new COVID cut and color. Yeah. <laughs> you look great. You look really great. I like it short, really short anyway. And I got really tired of worrying about not being able to go and touch up little spots. So I thought, you know what? Just let it grow out. I think I kind of, it's cool. It looks, yeah, it looks fantastic. great. Fantastic. Nice Thank to meet you, you, Lucy. Nice to meet you. <laughs> right, you want to get started? Yeah, we're supposed to talk about music. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, so let's talk about, I want to talk about the collaboration with um, the two of you and um, their playing our song. And the Marvin, how one or much the last one? Yeah, well, I watched, I watched the reunion on YouTube. It was fantastic. Oh, so, man. Yeah, so you're talking about the first one when we first We the, can talk about both. Well, the original, oh my God. Mm. <laughs> Larry, I hardly remember, you know, mm. I feel like I didn't get to know you until we were open practically. Yeah, right. <laughs> so much work to begin just to learn everything and mm -hmm. and work a, a, the show out in Los Angeles and I was pretty brand new to I was my first Broadway show mm -hmm. so uh, I just remember that whole experience is just being such a gift oh my god to be your first Broadway show the one just before that was also in New York but it was out at Jones Beach that big beautiful you know, auditorium, I mean, auditorium, it's on the water, the Jones Beach Theater, right on the bay, and it's an 8,000 seat theater. You did Annie Get Your Gun, right? I did Annie Get Your Gun, um, at Jones Beach, and that mm -hmm. was amazing, with Mark hmm. Fresnel, you know, I mean, doesn't get better than that. So I thought, and then next thing I knew, I was being sent the script for a new Neil Simon musical with words and music by Marvin Hamlish and Carol Bayer Sager. And I had... I was like one of the few people, my friends, who actually loved, already loved Carol Bayer Sager. I had all of her albums. I thought she was just insanely talented. I loved her voice too. And I wanted to <laughs> sing like her in the show. Yesterday when I was gone. And um, <laughs> then I, I auditioned during my run of Annie Get Your Gun. Were you there, Dad? You ha were you already hired, Larry? I was already hired, but they didn't care what I thought, so it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so you weren't there. But I, I remember I talked about this in my show. My, I do a, I do, back in the day when we were still working, uh, yeah. I do a show nowadays called uh, I Got the Job, Songs from My Musical Past. I saw that and on your website. It's fun because it's the first time I've ever actually done one of my concerts. I've been in concerts for 30 years. I never did a concert talking about my theater musical history. Mm. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't even be doing concerts, right? So... It's the first really authentic show I've done. It's all about me. I don't have to mm. create ways to get into these songs, you know? And um, I talk about that audition and how amazing it was. Uh, audition for Manny and, and Neil and Carol and Robert Moore, the director, Manny Eisenberg, our producer. And uh, I screwed up the song that I sang. I remember that. I sat backwards on a chair, real cash, because I already read the scene and I thought the scene went really well. I did the scene well. And then they said, do you want to sing? I said, yeah, okay, great. And uh, I'm playing a lyricist. So I thought, I'll, I'm going to sing a song that I wrote the lyrics to because I was sort of a closet lyricist at the time. I was really proud of this song. And I sat down and they started playing and I sang and I got about, I don't know, 13 words in and completely forgot what I was saying. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> and I just, made, I made some horrible you know, sad joke like, and I wrote that. <laughs> and started again, and I did, okay, fine. And I got through it, and it was fine. And this is back in the day when you're not in one of these awful rehearsal rooms with the fluorescent lighting like they <laughs> do today. It was back in the day when you really auditioned on stage, on the Broadway stage. So it's dark, you know, and the people are actually in the theater. And that's the way we like to work. We don't like to be in a room with all the lights on with watching everybody on their cell phones, you know. Well, now they're auditioning on this thing. On Zoom. Exactly. <laughs> That's actually probably better. You can't really see the other people as well. But I remember at the end of the audition, Neil Simon he came up and he took both of my hands in his. And he came up on the stage. And I thought, oh, God, that's Neil Simon. Because he's got the glasses. We recognize Neil Simon. And he took my hands in his and he said, you're such a breath of fresh air. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, what a great thing to say. And he laughed and I was just like, flying. I thought, this is the coolest thing. I just like on a cloud. And I didn't hear from anybody for almost two months. Not a word. <laughs> Nothing. Radio <laughs> silence. Like, what did I do? 
And, but turns out I was the first person they auditioned. Manny told me months later, he said, you're the first person we saw. We had like 200 people we had to go see. We had to go out to LA, we had to go to Chicago, blah, blah, blah. So after they saw all those people, I finally got a call back and I came back in. This just goes to show you, I thought, you know, terrible audition, right? And I got a call back and I came in and I sang for Marvin. He wanted to hear people again. I sang for Marvin and I remember leaving the stage and crying and saying, that's the worst audition I ever did in my whole life. That's the worst, mm. and I don't want, no one could want this part more than me. This is me, Sonia is me. I have to, why, why am I so bad? And that night I got the call, you got the job. <laughs> you know what's funny, Lucy, I, I don't remember hearing any other name than yours mentioned. Really? Because that's so funny, when I was way out in Massapequa doing Annie, mm -hmm. and I had auditioned, all that time when I was waiting, like a month, month and a half, whatever it was, I read the papers every day and I heard that Bette Midler was doing the show. And then I heard that they were talking to Cher. And then I heard that Barbara wanted <laughs> So, you know, I'm dying. I'm like, I'll never get the no. You get the part, it's incredible. That's, and it was just a magnificent experience with such pros. Marvin changed my life with what he said to me one day. No. Why don't you, I don't remember, you had to have been there. We were working out one song at the, upright piano Larry in, in Los Angeles and I forget what it was maybe it was just for tonight or something mm -hmm. and I was sort of learning the notes and how the ga 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 and, and he stopped me and he said you know I think I I think I want to lower this key for you <gasps> I was devastated <laughs> I thought I really disappointed him because if you come from Summerstock and regional theater really the only uh, scores that they get are the original scores. You yeah, know? they don't lower a key for anybody. They don't so. lower a key, and that you have to hit the notes that that song is written in. It's before computers where you just, you know, mm -hmm. put it in the And so I knew that if you couldn't hit certain notes, you don't do certain shows. And and I said, oh no, Marvin, I, I, I'm sure I can get it. I'm sure, you know, I'm just learning this now, but if I learn, he said, ah, stop, what do you think? I'm married to these notes? <laughs> <laughs> it was the best thing ever. He said, listen, I, I hired you for your sound, for your voice. And, and every instrument is different. You know, an oboe is not a violin. A violin is a, a saxophone. A saxophone's not a harp, right? And he said, you have to, you know, respect the instrument that you're given. And then he wrote the song for my voice. Yeah. And it's the first time I ever felt like a singer. Like, hmm. I'm a singer that a, a wonderful composer actually wants to write music for. And it changed the way I thought about my work after that. Amazing. I have to tell you two little stories. Uh, one involves you very directly, but when we did the recording, uh, we had to do a show that night. And I was down in the pit, and the house lights were dimming. And Marvin comes running down to the pit and says, Hey, babe, hey, babe, give me your score. I said, Marvin, the, sh the show's starting. He said, Give me your score, give me your score. So I handed him my score, and the spotlight hit me for the overture. And he, he went running up the aisle with my score. Now, here's the punchline. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> and you conducted it without the score. I, but at that point, you know, I knew the show had been in rehearsals and Franny was at the piano. And she just yeah. glared at me like, what are you going to do now? But of course, I know. But, but this is one of my favorite stories. And I, and I want to share it with the world. It's so Marvin. <laughs> it's so but, you know, it's a compliment that he would do that knowing he'll be fine. Like, Larry will be mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. He was right. so funny, but my my favorite is, as you know, I still believe in love w was changed how many times where they couldn't decide. Well, I don't if remember that. like the one actual change where they yeah. put it into the show when I had to sing a different song, but I tell that story in the show too. Um, well, the, the version the version of my story is I remember they changed it and the lyric changed and all that, but I remember they had some lyric revisions. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah. Like with all conductors, <laughs> you would look down at the pit and look at the conductor if you forgot a lyric or if you went up just for a key word. Yeah. And, and they had changed the lyric on you just enough that there was no way to remember it. Be because well, luckily, though, luckily, it was a recording studio scene. Yes. Yeah. So I actually <laughs> could put the music in front of me that night mm -hmm. if I needed it. It turns out I didn't need it, but that was one of the hardest songs I've ever had to learn. I think I had two nights to learn it. Yeah. You know, because again, they couldn't just go did did on a computer. They had all these there were copyists. Copyists, a brand new word for you to learn, folks. Back in the day, <laughs> yeah. there were people who actually copied each note in every song for each 
person in the orchestra. And we had how many people? 20? Yeah, tw 26, 28. Hey, yeah. 26 pieces. When Marvin says, hey, I think I'm going to write a new song, suddenly everybody's going to give it a shot. Well, somebody has to write the music for all these people to play. So the mm. copy is up there like crazy. Eight of them in the balcony going blind, right? Blah, blah, blah. And, and it was a huge change. The, the song they changed it to was, you know, after all the tears I cried, you'd think I would give up on love, get off this line. Maybe I might get it right this time. That's the melody for I Still Believe in Love. Everybody knows that. The melody that, the song that they changed it to went, today the sun came out at midnight the moon refused to shine. It's really low, like an mm -hmm. old voice whispered low, saying, don't you cry, there's a reason why. When one star dies, another says, hello. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that and going, what does that mean? When one star dies, another says, hello, the day the sun came out at midnight? So I learned it though, and we made it as happy as we yeah. could, right, Larry? You know, today oh, the that. sun came out in midnight, the moon refused to shine, and all voice was pretty low. And we did it sort of like that. And then I guess he did it two nights, three nights maybe. And Marvin came back to the dressing room and he said, Okay, okay, you know what? It's almost perfect. It's 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 so close. And then he dropped down on my floor with scissors and tape, you remember this, and he cut and pasted together his favorite sections of I Still Believe in Love, and this new, what was they cleverly titled it, I Still Believe in Love In, because <laughs> it was so different. So it was a hybrid. But, yeah, and, they, <laughs> and he was like, happy. so it would, and then at one point he even put the new crazy lyric <laughs> over the old melody. So I had to like do this. Yep. Ah, da, 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 da. That's the old melody. So it was today the sun came out at midnight. The wise old moon had lost its glow. Yet I know. Sa, da, 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 da. And today, da, da, da. And <laughs> jump back into the other one. Oh my God. But we did it. We got through. So what, was he, what was he trying to, what was that, what was he trying to accomplish? Was it a dramatic? Okay. So interestingly enough, maybe. We know now this was 40 years ago, right? Mm. Maybe 10 years ago, I'm talking to Carol Bayer Sager, and I said to her, by the way, <laughs> what, were, what was the point of I still believe in loving? Why did you go that way? It's so different from the song. She goes, you know, Marvin and I thought we would write something like MacArthur Park. <laughs> yeah, they wanted a hit song. I have to tell you something which you didn't know. When we did the 40th anniversary last year, at the Music Box in New York for the Actors Fund. I was on stage with Lucy and Robert Klein in the middle of the stage with my back to the audience in this big orchestra in front of mm -hmm. me. So I realized that I could not be part of the show. So I very deliberately never turned around to respond to a joke or laugh because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the third character. Right. So, so I was you facing- You want to be Leon. That's right. <laughs> I was facing- facing upstage and very carefully. I was laughing at everything, but just being a conductor. When we got to the end of the first half, uh, Robert left the stage. <laughs> you can tell the rest. <laughs> this is the song I sing uh, just for tonight. Beautiful song. And, and we're, we have decided for our first time to go to, you know, Quag and have this illicit affair, it's a wonderful thing. And he has run off to go get the suitcases. And while he's gone, I sing just for tonight. And it's like, just this one time, it couldn't hurt anybody, let's just do this thing. And it's beautiful. And the song ends and he's supposed to run back in with the suitcase and go, you know, let's hurry up, uh, two seagulls just spotted me or something. <laughs> like that. And so we finish that night and it gets great applause. And it gets great applause and gets great applause and I'm waiting for him to come in and so I it looks like I'm milking it Larry you know, like I'm just gonna milk the thing but I'm waiting for him to interrupt me he doesn't interrupt me he's not there and so now I just think oh, it's really a great house isn't it a great house and I wander up to you and yeah, you yeah. go I don't know where the hell he is <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he is. I wander over to Ron Abel at the piano and he goes yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, Vernon! Oh, Vernon! Nothing. And because <laughs> we're only in this theater for one night, the backstage crew is 
barely knows who we are, right? And yeah. they don't know what the show is. Or is he supposed to be here? Is he not supposed to be here? What happened was Robert forgot and thought it was intermission. <gasps> yeah. He just yeah. was done. He was like, bye. And he went upstairs to where the dressing room was and plopped down on the sofa and started picking up his messages. That's how <laughs> casual he did the show. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. Yeah, he did look very casual. <laughs> Unbelievable. And all of a sudden, you can hear people off stage going, <laughs> and then suddenly, <laughs> he's running and he comes running with the bags like this. Hi, hi, hi. And the seagulls spotted me. Hurry up. <laughs> not supposed to pee until after intermission, until intermission, is what I said. You're not supposed to pee until intermission. And he went, Jesus. And then we went <laughs> on and came back in again. And we went on. Oh, great that's what's great, great moments in theater. theater. Yeah. yeah. But every single song that night at that 40th was insane. It was everybody in the audience seemed like they were just rabid fans of the mm. show mm -hmm. of ours. I don't know. It was not just family and friends, though. We packed the whole music box theater and couldn't get a seat. It was only one night. After every song, I just welled up inside. Especially, mm. I still believe in love. That was a that sure. was an incredible moment. But Lucy, since then, yes, you have you you have <laughs> since since the, those halcyon years, uh, you've been doing uh, many, 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 many. I mean, aside from shows and some plays and stuff like that, but uh, concertizing for a long time with Ron Abel and doing, uh, you know, your act forever and very successfully. So talk about that a little bit. Well, I always thought that was something that, you know, I would do eventually, but it wasn't until after my dad died and I inherited uh, some cassettes of his big band, the Desi Arnaz Orchestra, mm -hmm. and I put them on in my car and I started listening. And I just was like, God, mm -hmm. I would feel to be in front of an orchestra that's that good with arrangements like that, of such great songs and such great arrangements. I really want to do that. I just sort of threw it out. You know, I wasn't really even actively thinking about it. I just sort of put it out. They say, tell the universe what you mm -hmm. want, be specific, right? And uh, very soon after that, I got a call from somebody in, um, from a man, Mario Di Maria, who's in Sicily, and he was putting together uh, an evening of Irving Berlin for Irving's 100th birthday that year, 1988, at the Teatro Verde in Sicily, outside, like thousands of people, 4,000 people outside. And he wanted 90 minutes of Irving Berlin. And I went, from me? Like, <laughs> I don't have a nightclub. I don't do, I don't even do counselors. How, why, what's, where'd you get this list? Is it just alphabetical? Or am I on, you know, I was like Sicily, like who's calling me to do this? <laughs> but I had just met Ron Abel doing a benefit somewhere. And I was kind of amazed. He was very capable writing arrangements at the drop of a hat, you know, and he could do everything. He's like you, Larry. He's like, mm -hmm. he can do it all. And, um, I told this guy, I said, well, how does this work? And he told me there would be a fee. And it was something, it was not like a lot. Of, it was like $30,000. And he had to put 90 minutes of show together from scratch. And I had to do it. I had to produce it. And it's Irving Berlin. So it's going to be dances like Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Annie Get Your Gun, you know, Tin Pan Alley, ballads from heaven. And uh, I had just had a meeting with my managers who, telling them that I would really like to do Concerts. I'd like to go into nightclubs. I, I heard these wonderful cassettes from my father and everybody talked me out of it. No, you don't. You don't want to do that. You mm. don't want to do that. Nobody, you can't make any money doing that. So, you know, it's an a-hole of show business. You'll never amortize the costs, all of which is true, usually. <laughs> but I said, no, but I, I really do want to do it. I really do want to do it. They wouldn't let me do it. They wouldn't even talk to me about it. So it's after that, I go home, I get that call and I've just met Ron. So I said, well, he said $30,000. My agents and managers are telling me it would be like $150,000 to put this together. Ron went, well, I don't know, usually costumes and stuff, blah, blah, blah. Ron gave me this amazing price, which I couldn't probably get a Larry Blank arrangement for this now. <laughs> but he gave me this amazing price because he wasn't the Ron Abel he is today either then. It's 1988. And we put together 90 minutes of Irving Berlin hmm. to take over there. I hired three dancers because I had to tap and do all this other <laughs> stuff, right? And we go to Italy and that's how my club act started. And the funny bit is I'm getting ready to go. So I want to have a run through at 
sound studio, right? To make sure it all works and the costumes and all that. So I put it together. Who am I going to invite? My friends, my managers, my agents. They come like to look. And when it's all over, they say to me, this is great. We should book this. I can book this in Vegas. I can book this, you know, and, and all over the <laughs> city. You want to do this around the country? You want to book a tour? I wanted to kill these people. <laughs> really? You think? So we did. I came home from Sicily and I started doing that. And when it wasn't Irving Berlin's birthday anymore, you know, it took out a little Berlin, put in a little Cy Coleman, put in a little Gershwin. Hmm. 30 years later, it's some of the most fun I ever have is going on stage and doing this with my a big band, you know, or a small band. Played Rainbow and Stars with three people after doing several years of the big band stuff. Um, and it's evolved into your own show, right, Lucy? That's yeah, what, well, it's always just great music, right? Mm -hmm. It's just always great music. Mm -hmm. It's just an evening with Lucy Arnest, mm -hmm. whatever that is. You know, the other thing that, <laughs> that I, it just flashed in my mind, I forgot that we also did my one and only together. Oh, you but know, I always forget that. <laughs> I don't know why. If it wasn't for your wife, I probably would never remember it because you came in late, right? You came in late or did you start and then well, late? I forget. What happened was uh, I had kind of uh, taken a, a year off from show business and I was actually teaching flying, if the truth be known. I'd become oh. a flight instructor wow. just, <laughs> just to do something else. And, and Jack Lee, the conductor of my one and only, said, stop this crap and come in and play piano in the pit. So I was playing piano in the pit of my one and only and Kaylin, who uh, we were dating at the time, uh, came in as a replacement dancer. That's what it was. On That's the right. show. And, and uh, shortly after that, you were the one who announced at a party uh, that we were expecting our first child. <laughs> So you had to get married. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was oh. a secret, but Lucy let everybody know. So it was well, like, you know, I figure pretty soon they're going to see. They're going to find out. <laughs> but but uh, Toon made her leave the show because she kept on running off from the wings and losing and her vomiting. lunch. Where yeah. was this? This was here in L.A.? <laughs> well, oh, we started yeah, all over. No. Yeah, we toured. I was. It was the first national company of my one and only. Uh, Tommy had done it on Broadway with Twiggy and then Sandy Duncan and her husband Don Korea took over for a while on Broadway and Sandy did the international company with Tommy because I was pregnant with Kate and he had asked me but I was like hello I don't think I can do it <laughs> and then so he went off they went on and then he called me I know how long that tour was eight months or something like that and he says are you done yet <laughs> yes I have a baby she's six weeks old and he goes good so you can go into rehearsals and it literally I did this show when Kate was like, you know, a couple months old and uh, they, you know, flew up, I mean, drove up to uh, where I lived up in Katona, New York, and we learned the tap numbers and all that stuff for like three weeks. And then I followed Sandy into the show and we did the whole national company. It was great. Mm -hmm. That was another amazing opportunity. Dance with Tommy. <laughs> Lucy, did you know at an early age you wanted to be in music theater? Yeah, did. I did. <laughs> I knew really, really, really early. I, um, I actually started make-believe theater in my garage and I had a couple of girlfriends and we had a little make-believe theater company. It was not so make-believe to me. I had a bank account, a checkbook. It was called Proscenium Players. We had a chairman, you know, a treasurer. Uh, I know it's not that exciting, Larry. <laughs> Larry just leaves. <laughs> God, when you don't talk about him, he just like, <laughs> Actually, yeah. I had a dog wandering in the room. So oh, I was... no. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that's what I did. I, I kind of knew I wanted to get up on stage and make believe and stuff like that. And uh, I picked my high school because it had supposedly the best theater department in Los Angeles. Immaculate Heart High School, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. And they were. They were fabulous. And then because my mother was changing her series program, you know, changing the format, and she had seen me do all these plays in high school, and she kind of knew my heart was there. She asked me to come on the show, and I was like, no, I don't do that. I don't want to do that. I want to go to theater. I'm going to go to Northwestern, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to, I don't want to be on television. I really didn't want to be on television because she was television. Hmm. My father was music and producing, and my brother was rock and roll and playing the drums. I wanted something that was mine, you know? I didn't want to follow those footsteps. But we talked about it, and I thought, all right, so... At least I can learn my craft in a way with all these great people that are always on that show. 
And I stayed there six years. And then before it was even finished though, like four years in, I started doing summer stock and regional theater during the summers, you know, and whenever I had a hiatus. And that led to, you know, the national tour of Seesaw, with Michael Bennett, first national tour. I auditioned on my first Broadway, first Broadway-ish audition. And then other shows like that and Andy, get your gun. They're playing our song. Mm -hmm. and. Then I had a family and it didn't become <laughs> easy to just leave and do shows anymore. You know, mm -hmm. it's one thing to take Kate with me on their one and all, my one and only, but my boys were at home. I had two boys mm -hmm. and Larry had to start to take care of them while I was on the road. Then he'd bring them to me horrible. I could, oh, mm -hmm. I can't do that. And you know, you want to put them to bed. You want to give them baths. And I still regret that. It, I, I don't know. I, I, I <laughs> How do you, how do you, you know, does, does Caitlin sort of, does she think about that ever? Like she wishes she Well, could. sure, sure. For a long time, you know, she, she, once the kids came along, she just really said to me one day, I can't dance anymore. I got to take care of the kids. Lucy, let me ask you, where was the, the ranch? Because I, you know, I think I live not far from where you grew up out here. Uh, oh, you know, I'm in Granada Chats Hills, Ridge. Northridge. So. Yeah, they lived in Northridge in Chatsworth actually right and it was on devonshire boulevard i can't remember the exact right. address but it was 1700 and something devonshire right. Boulevard. now that place doesn't even exist with that address it's all part of a development so it's yes all yeah walls yeah. and it's a different address yeah that's where i was i'm, I was there I'm not far from there at all but really but, oh. but yeah i mean but i know at that time period it, it was the sticks because yeah. even when i moved out here in the 80s it was the sticks <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> but but yeah, now it's but like empty empty roads and orange groves or no orange yes. groves even just yeah. yeah, they moved way, way out someplace where they got this wonderful little plot of land and he put in a pool and fences and had cows and chickens and vegetable mm -hmm. garden. They lived like regular wonderful people yeah. until I Love Lucy happened and took it all away. I mean, mm -hmm. that's funny to say, right? <laughs> but it's true. Well, Lucy, well, you were a gem. Thank you so much for for Thank talking you. with us. It's this a pleasure really to, to talk about the good stuff. Yeah, good yeah. Stuff. You see Larry. I know. You see my birthday partner. <laughs> yeah, we, we should say hello. You have the same birthday? Lucy. Two days but, apart. Oh, okay. Two days apart. <laughs> well, well thank you so much, Lucy. It's great to meet you and to chat great with to you. See you both, really. All right, we say okay. goodbye? Yeah. Yeah. All right. okay. Bye, you guys. Thank you again. Be well. Stay, you too. Stay healthy and happy. Love you. See you soon. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. And now I'm falling, falling fast again. Why do I always take a fall when I fall in love? Just for today, I want to hold you just for tonight. You'll be my dream, and when the morning comes to wake me, that's all right. It couldn't hurt anyone. It wouldn't hurt. Working it out, that's what I'm trying to do. Working it out. Who stands for me, baby? For Leon, for me and you. Working it out, it should be easy to do. But you never had to work it out. You never had to work it out. You never had to work it out. Work it out. Work it out for two. Play and I'm too bad at ending. Come let me on out of home. It's just a song.